Access Cavity Preparation Maxillary Incisors Hello and welcome to another session on Access Cavity Preparation. This discussion will focus on maxillary incisors. Let's have a quick recap of what we learned last time. Pop Quiz Moving on, let me tell you about another interesting case that I treated. A patient with severe pain in his upper central incisor was reported at my practice. He said that the pain didn't resolve on taking medications and that there had been blackish discoloration on the tooth for the past few months. On clinical examination, the tooth was tender on percussion and did not respond to pulp vitality tests. On radiographic assessment, I realized that the caries had extended to the pulp due to which the patient complained of severe pain. This demanded an immediate endodontic intervention. As you may recall, central incisors have an average length of 22.8 mm with the pulp chamber located in the center of the crown and equidistant from the dentinal walls. The pulp is broad mesiodistally and follows the contours of the crown. It has three pulp horns and lacks distinction between the pulp chamber and the root canal. The maxillary central incisors have one root and one canal, where the canal is broad labiopalatally. With this prerequisite knowledge, I arranged my access opening instruments and injected local anesthesia at the site of interest. I then gained access by removing the enamel in the center by holding the air rotor perpendicular to the long axis of the tooth with a number 4 round burr. On realizing that the burr head had entered the tooth completely, I slowly made the burr parallel to the long axis of the tooth. The axis cavity resembled a triangle, with the base of the triangle being towards the incisal edge. I continued to go deeper and laterally till I felt a drop. Now what do you think is this drop? It is the dip of the burr into the pulp-filled chamber that indicates its entrance. While following Bertucci's six laws diligently, I extirpated the pulpal tissue from the chamber. Following Kasner and Rankow's laws, I was able to locate the single orifice, achieve a straight line axis into the root canal, and enlarge the orifice using Gates Glidden drill in chronological order. The palatal shoulder was also removed by moving it inside out using light strokes. Once the palatal shoulder had been removed, I could directly access the apical areas of the root and I verified by placing the DG-16 Explorer. DG stands for Dr. David Green, who designed it in 1951. What do you think is the chronological order to use a GG drill? And what does each number represent? Keep watching for the answer. During this entire procedure of access cavity preparation and pulp excavation, I kept irrigating the access cavity so that no debris was pushed out of the root canal in the periapex. Let me answer another question from our previous session. Why does frothing happen in the champagne bubble test? So, when sodium hypochlorite solution is flooded into the access cavity, it dissociates into sodium and chloride ions and liberates free oxygen. It reacts with pulpal tissue or residual viscous chelator if used. Hence, liberating bubbles or froth. While preparing the access cavity of maxillary central incisors, you should always be mindful of the labial surface of the root lying in proximity to the cortical plates. 
meaning you may find fenestration and dehiscence there. In case of an abscess, a labial cortical plate perforation may be seen. This makes the central incisor one of the most prone teeth to labial perforations while access is being attempted. Therefore, burr angulation during access opening plays an important role in preventing labial perforations. Now let's have a look at how the access cavity preparation of the maxillary lateral incisor is different from the central incisor. The shape of the pulp chamber is similar to the central incisor, but just smaller. Unlike centrals, the laterals only have two pulp horns. The pulpal chamber is broad mesiodistally, with no marked distinction between the chamber and the canals. The chances of perforation, both labial and palatal, in maxillary lateral incisors are quite the same. Similarly, the abscess can drain both palatally and labially due to the distal curvature of the root. As the name suggests, lateral canals are more frequent in the laterals than in the central incisors. The root is conical in configuration with a finer diameter than central incisors and may occasionally exhibit a finer constriction towards the apex. The cross section shows that the canals are ovoid, which slowly becomes round at the apical third. The access opening is the same for both. A smaller round burr, a number two rather than number four, is used for the initial access due to the size difference in the tooth. Pop quiz. With this, let's go through the essential points in relation to the axis cavity preparations of maxillary incisors. Maxillary central incisors have three pulp horns, a single root, and in most cases, a single root canal. Access opening is triangular. Most commonly seen error is labial perforation. Maxillary lateral incisors are smaller in dimension have two pulp horns, single conical root, and one root canal, labial and lingual perforation, due to root curvature. Mode of access opening is the same for all the incisors, where burr is initially placed perpendicular to the long axis of the tooth and then parallel to the long axis, till the drop is felt, thus accessing the pulp chamber which is deroofed for straight line access. With this, we come to the end of this video. The next video discusses the access cavity preparation of mandibular incisors. We hope you had fun learning with us.